and welcome to Contact. I'm Craig Delahunt, and on today's show, we'll be talking with the chairman of UBC's Department of Geography and Atmospheric Studies, Dr. Gordon McBean. Thank you for joining us, Gordon. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Gordon, you've just got back from uh, an interesting trip to uh, Holland, and actually, I believe you're a guest of the Queen. Would you like to tell us about that? Well, it was an interesting trip. The Dutch, as you probably know, are very interested environmentally, and the Royal Academies of Holland organized a one-day discussion and conference on global change, the change of our environment, and including climate change. And I was invited to be the opening speaker on the climate change issue. The Queen was invited, but we I guess they didn't expect she was going to come, but she did come, and she attended through the first presentation in mine, and then we had a nice discussion over coffee for about half an hour. Well, and she's very informed environmentally. She asks good questions and knows a lot about the topic. And she's actually taking a leading role environmentally and setting quite an example. As a matter of fact, you're talking about her green bus. Yes, she uh, had just acquired a, a new bus, a very fancy looking bus, but the purpose of this was so that her entourage, which typically takes five or six automobiles to transport around the Netherlands, can be replaced by and carried by this one bus. So instead of five cars, we have one bus, and the Queen will be included in that bus. So it's a very interesting and uh, very proactive environmental uh, mm -hmm. position for a Queen of a country. Can you tell us about the committee that you're on and, and what your talk was about and why you were there? Well, I am the chairman of an international scientific committee for what is called the World Climate Research Program. This is a program that organizes research activities on the climate. Why is the climate changing? Trying to understand the role of oceans and clouds, um, the role of hydrology, the ice, and the, et cetera, and, and how these work together to cause our climate to change. Yes, so, so an aside, do you think the majority of scientists believe that uh, the climate is changing or may change? The majority. Yeah, I think there is a, a majority consensus that the climate will change. Um, I don't think that most scientists yet would say that we can establish with certainty that the climate warming that has taken place in the last hundred years is due to the greenhouse effect that humans have caused. But we, uh, I think, are very uh, confident in our in our predictions that we will see that greenhouse warming over the next hundred years. What were some of the uh, things covered at the uh, conference in Holland? Well, one main issue was the greenhouse warming question and whether and how industry and government should respond to this. In Holland, they are discussing a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. The uh, cabinet is seriously considering imposing in some way controls that would reduce the Dutch emissions of carbon dioxide. Um, other issues that were discussed there were the more general global environmental change issues, what is the impact on biodiversity and environmental things, um, and what could be the role of the countries and the scientific community working with industry. And this meeting was actually organized as an interface between industry and the scientific community. Now, NASA has just re released a report actually that shocked the world that there may be a 30 to 40 percent decrease in ozone over the northern hemisphere in the next year during the next year, actually starting this spring. Um, now, is that a more immediate and serious problem than global warming could be? Well, it's certainly a more immediate problem, and I think it is very serious. Um, we, we know that the ozone layer is being dramatically decreased in its, uh, in its strength and its ability to shield us from ultraviolet radiation. And we know that uh, both from lab studies and some epidemiological kind of work, that, that the impacts of increased ultraviolet radiation will have on humans and plants, vegetation, etc. Climate warming is a longer term issue, which I think has much potentially more devastating impacts on the longer term. Um, should we survive the short term? Should we survive the short term? Yeah. And, and I think you believe that we probably will. Um, what are you basing that on? Just optimism or? Well, I mean, are we dead ducks? No, I, I don't personally think we are dead ducks. I think we have to start being much more conscious, though, of the things that we are doing to the environment, to the ozone layer, and in the longer term to our climate, and start recognizing that we are only one part of the system, and by being so uh, wasteful in our use of energy and our wasteful generally in our sort of misuse of things that we are, starting to change this environment that we have grown accustomed mm -hmm. to. 
why do scientists believe that global warming is taking place? Are there actual measurements that are actually showing that with the uh, CO2 increase there has been a rise in temperature? Because there's a lot of argument on, on this. Yes. Well, first of all, the, the global warming consensus is based on the fact that we have observed the amount of carbon dioxide to increase. And it's increased by roughly 25% in the atmosphere. That's by direct measurement. And, and where are we taking these measurements uh, uh, and how? Well, most of the measurements are made in, uh, well, there's about 20 places around the world where they just literally take mm -hmm. a bottle full of air, mm -hmm. take it back to the lab, and you very carefully analyze it. And you find that the amount of carbon dioxide and methane gas and nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases has increased by mm -hmm. significant amounts over what they were uh, 200 years ago. We know what they were 200 years ago actually by analyzing the, the air that was trapped in ice as it froze in the glaciers of Greenland and Antarctica. And so this has given us a, a record of the, of the past of the atmospheric composition through these trapped bubbles of air. Now the other thing that we know about the greenhouse effect is that, first of all, we, there is a natural greenhouse effect. The climate of this earth is, is much warmer, it's over 30 degrees Celsius, warmer than it would be if we didn't have a greenhouse effect. And that's due to water vapor and carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. And it seems to me, first of all, intuitively and as a scientist, unlikely that if you have a 30 some degree warming because you have some greenhouse gas and you add more greenhouse gas that the climate is going to respond in some way and very likely warm mm -hmm. and that's that plus we have very sophisticated models many of them now and they all show warming when you increase the amount of carbon dioxide these models all show climate warming how about temperature uh, measurements are they showing warming also or is that a little mm -hmm. fuzzier well, the temperature measurements do show that in the past century we've had approximately one half a degree Celsius global warming of the temperatures. Now, I have to say that that in could be entirely natural variability. We have seen over the past thousands of years in this climate where, and certainly well before the time humans were having any impact on it, that the temperatures go up and down. They go up, have gone up to uh, as much as a degree warmer than they are now and of course when we had the ice ages they were about five degrees Celsius colder and I uh, believe even a thousand years ago there was there was they were growing grapes and or whoever was there was growing grapes in Newfoundland and uh, in England so, so I guess yeah. there's a natural variability. Yeah there is a natural variability and we think these are due to a mixture of things the certainly the the earth varies its orbit around the Sun and this is we think is the cause of the ice ages and that takes place on much longer time scales like 40, 50, 100,000 years. The variations that take place on a 10 to a few hundred years, I think are due to the ocean adjusting and readjusting to various things, which we don't fully understand yet. Mm -hmm. You're actually mentioning that um, the possible increase of, in temperature that they were expecting may not have happened because of aerosols. And this is a new study or a new fact or a new uh, process that's come in that uh, may be explaining why it hasn't heated up as fast as it would. Yes, I think this is something we've become much more aware of in the last two years due to some very interesting work done by scientists in various labs that is now showing that aerosols, these are little particles of dust that get into the atmosphere, are gained primarily by us as humans burning fossil fuel and smelting metal. So we produce a lot of sulfur dioxide which produces little particles that first of all reflect the sunlight back and hence cool the climate a little bit. They also make clouds brighter and a brighter cloud also reflects the sunlight back mm -hmm. more. So that the effect of these aerosols has been over the last 10 or 20 years about very approximately equal and opposite to what we've seen with the gre enhanced greenhouse effects. So these may be just counterbalancing each other, but we have no reason to believe, in fact we have reason to believe otherwise, that over the next 50 or 20 to 50 years, the greenhouse effect will continue to compound itself. Uh, now, um, some people believe, or scientists, astronomers believe, that uh, Venus may be, may be the example of a runaway greenhouse effect. Well, could that possibly happen on Earth? Uh, when you take into consideration the amount of CO2 that could be released if all the fossil fuels were burnt? I think it's unlikely we would get a runaway greenhouse effect as on, on Venus. I mean, the greenhouse effect on our planet is roughly 30 degrees Celsius. On Venus, it's, it's 477, I think, degrees Very Celsius. Warm. Very warm. 
and their atmosphere is 90% carbon dioxide. Our atmosphere is about 0.03% carbon dioxide. So we're a long way from the Venus situation. What we have, of course, in the atmosphere is water vapor, which is a greenhouse gas, but the raining out of water out of the air it actually takes some carbon dioxide with it. Uh, and we have plants that, are, of course, are using up the carbon dioxide. So I think it's unlikely we'd have a runaway greenhouse effect. But it's a demonstration of the direction in which things could go. How much CO2 do you think would be, uh, would the CO2 be increased in the atmosphere if we did burn all of the uh, fossil fuels? Oh, I think it will definitely go up. I mean, I think the projections that if humans don't start reducing their fossil fuel consumption is that it will double and triple in the next uh, um, 100 to 150 years. Now, would that necessarily be bad? I mean, um, they say that plants do better in a carbon dioxide enriched environment, and uh, the more plants, the more food for the increasing population. What do you think about that? Do um, you think there's any basis in that? Well, there are certainly lab studies in controlled environments where people put in you know, a lot, masses amounts of extra carbon dioxide, and the tree grows a lot faster. Although I'm told by some of my forestry colleagues that this is is not something that you would expect to continue on and on. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, sort of an initial spurt of growth, and then once the plants come accustomed to it, it's not likely they would continue to grow. And, then, and it may be then that temperature and water would also be limiting on plant growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, these plants in the labs with extra carbon dioxide are growing under ideal conditions, not real natural conditions. So. What about the fact that maybe in Canada our, um, our, our wheat belts may be increased? Uh, we may be able to grow uh, more crops further north. Uh, maybe we'll have resorts on the Arctic Circle. It, 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 well, no, yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say, I mean, the global warming is not all negative. What is of concern is that, that our whole in ecological system and even our economic and social systems have, have developed over centuries to become accustomed to the present climate. And we're talking about changes of the climate in the next 100 years that are far greater than has happened in at least 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And so it is the rate of change and the inability of natural ecosystems and even human-controlled ecosystems and in social structures and things to adjust that rapidly. So it's, it's, that is the concern, not necessarily that it's warm, because certainly the Peace River country may in fact be a, a much better agricultural area, although our models indicate the Canadian prairies will suffer from uh, much more frequency of drought. So I think there is a, a, a major negative there. Now there's also a fear, I believe, that um, there's a lot of methane trapped in the Arctic, and I guess with global warming that would be released. <coughs> And I believe that um, could contribute to global warming at a much greater scale than CO2. Is there, is there a foundation in that uh, argument? Yes, well, there are several what we call biospheric feedback processes, which have not been well enough understood that we could include them in a proper way in our climate models and our predictions. But it's interesting that almost all of what we call these biospheric feedbacks would cause an enhanced rate of, of climate warming. As you mentioned, the methane release from the permafrost. Right now, we put in roughly 7 billion tons of carbon per year into the atmosphere as humans, but only 3 billion tons or so stays there. The other 4 billion, we think, goes into the ocean. But it goes into the cold parts of the ocean, and it comes out of the warm parts of the ocean. Now, as we warm the climate, we could warm the ocean enough that it won't take up its three or four billion tons as it's doing now. And so even if we didn't increase our own emissions, we would see the oceans helping us out less in the future. Mm -hmm. And so the atmospheric rate would go up. So there's several of these processes. And they all seem, well, most of them seem to work to make the problem more, uh, more, more warming in the future. What are some of the positive and neg negative effects that global warming might have on BC, say, Canada, and the world? I know um, if you heat up the oceans, you could possibly get more hurricanes. Um, we've got uh, possibly sea level rise. What are, what are uh, some of the effects that might happen, say, here right in BC that might... Uh well, the sea level rise is a concern, but probably our economic system is such that we could afford to accommodate that. I think we are more concerned about the forests and the trees, as I've said, are accustomed to our present climate and a tree doesn't naturally migrate very far, 
as the climate and will not be able to adapt to the climate change. And the question, though, is you know, maybe we should be telling our forest companies to reforest with a different kind of tree, but we're not confident enough yet in our own predictions of how the climate will change. We don't know what humans are going to do, so it's very hard to make those kind of judgments. Mm -hmm. But we see things like with the warming we will have uh, and with the probable decrease in precipitation in the interior of BC, or the southern interior, we could have much more difficulty with the uh, agricultural areas of the Okanagan in the interior of British Columbia. Um, fish that tend to spawn in cold streams will be disrupted because those streams will be a bit warmer. And as we have an earlier spring, the timing of runoff and snowmelt will change. We don't know how those will mm -hmm. affect the fish. But nonetheless, fishing is an important part of our, our province's economy, an important part of our just recreational activities. We presumably have less snow for skiing, but maybe warmer temperatures for lying in the sun if you want to uh, take your chance on the ozone problem. Right. What about some of the other areas of the world? I guess uh, <coughs> Bangladesh, if there's sea level rise, or uh, some of the other places where it's already very arid, Ethiopia, um, could be devastating. Yeah, I think it, that we have to recognize that this is a global issue. We live in a global economy, and uh, certainly a country like Bangladesh, if we had a one meter sea level rise, which is possible by the end of the next century, um, would lose 17 percent, I think, of its arable land. Some countries' island republics in the Pacific almost disappear when you raise the sea level by that amount. Now, now has the sea level risen at all? And yes, well, the evidence is it has ridden, risen uh, about 10 centimeters in the last 100 years, although it's somewhat difficult to tell because we have the the Earth's crust is changing its shape, and it's hard to tell whether it is sea level rise because the land is going down or the ocean is actually going mm -hmm. up. But we know certain mm -hmm. land glaciers are melting, uh, and the ocean itself is slightly warmer than it used to be, and warm water just expands. And that's where we think most of the sea level rise will come from anyway. Do you think El Nino is an effect of global warming, or do you think it's something that's been around for a long time? No, we think uh, El Nino is a different phenomenon. It is a natural phenomenon. It is, we know from some evidence that it goes back hundreds and thousands of years, probably. Uh, it certainly was occurring uh, at least a few hundred years ago, and it continues to occur roughly every four or five years. We're just starting another El Nino now. Definitely. Apparently in California, the flooding is, uh, well, it's very similar to what happened about eight years ago with our last El Nino. Well, we had the 82-83 was the big El Nino, the biggest, in a sense, warmest of the century. Uh, there was another weak one in 87, and you didn't see the impacts. And part of our our climate research program is to understand what causes El Ninos and better to be able to predict whether we will have a strong El Nino like 82-3 or a weak one that causes almost no impact like 80, 87. We're making some progress. Well, what, what does cause them? Just, just um, why do we think they... Uh... Well, the El Nino actually caught... We, we, we don't know what triggers it. But we do know that it starts with the winds, the trade winds of the tropical Pacific Ocean uh, slacken. And this causes changes in the upper ocean so that the region of the equatorial Pacific near Ecuador and Peru starts to warm up. And it's, it's actually warming up because we turn off the cold water that's coming up from below. The processes that normally cause this very nutrient-rich water and cold water to come from deep in the ocean to the surface which provides the nutrients for the fish and the cold water that the fish like. That process stops. Mm -hmm. The result is the ocean surface warms up. There is no nutrients. The fish die because of the lack of nutrients and the, and the warm water and the birds that live off the fish die. It is devastating for the local fishing economy of Ecuador, Peru areas. And then after some, it typically takes a year or so, this thing readjusts and the water starts cooling off again. Now, when it heats up, I guess it expands and starts flowing, because it, it comes right up here to Vancouver Island, apparently, uh, um, right to the tip. Northern yes. Tip. We get some evidence of that, like in 82, 83, there was, uh, although normally we don't see evidence of El Ninos at our latitude. It's not because it's, it's due to a series of things called wave motions that occur in the, in the ocean, uh, which are rather complex. Mm -hmm. um, there was a um, 
film aired here in, in Vancouver, actually in BC, on one of our stations, and it was um, created, I guess, by the coal lobby in uh, England, and uh, it was called Global Warming the Conspiracy, and it basically um, stated the case that uh, they felt that global warming probably wouldn't happen and that it was possibly a hoax. You saw the, the uh, film, what did you think of it, and um, what are some of the flaws in their arguments? Well, I did see the film. I was actually, by the time it was over, I was quite annoyed. I was, well, more than annoyed, I was quite mad, actually. I think that they had misused the quotes of some of the scientists who supported the global warming argument and overemphasized the negative aspects of some scientists who, who are questioning the, the degree of certainty on this. Mm -hmm. um, they made a great deal about the fact that it hasn't warmed yet and if it hasn't warmed yet, that must mean global warming isn't going to happen, and I think that is a false argument. Mm -hmm. The international scientific community that supports global warming agrees that it hasn't warmed yet due to greenhouse effect, and that's not part of our argument, but that is the argument that the people who feel it won't happen constantly come back to. The other thing they come back to is they say our models are no good. Well, they don't have the capability yet to handle all the variables, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they say our models aren't any good because we can't predict this year's climate based on the climate of, say, the 1960s. And I would argue that we don't attempt to do that. We've never been, and we don't claim that in, to be able to do that. What we do claim, though, is we can show the sensitivity of the climate to a change in something. And it's sort of like, uh, if I can use an economics analogy, we don't, I mean, most economists would, would be would agree that we can't predict the price of the Canadian dollar, for example, now based on the conditions in 1960. But they could also, but they could tell us how the Canadian dollar would change in its price if the government of Canada was to double the GST or some other major impact. Mm -hmm. And so that's the sensitivity of the price of the dollar can be predicted with some confidence when you say, given that we will change the GST, what will be the impact on the Canadian dollar? And what we're saying is changing the amount of carbon dioxide will change the climate in this way. It is sensitive to the change in the amount of carbon dioxide. Or, or it could change it in that way. And I yes. guess that's the, um, the, the concern. Now, there is a possibility maybe global warming will be good, but you stated that we have uh, one planet and we're conducting an experiment on that planet rather than in a lab. That's the, uh, the worry. So do you feel that we should be possibly trying to slow this down a bit, get, get control of it, so that uh, it's not something that's uh, running away or... Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that the scientific community is waving a huge warning flag. We're telling, trying to tell the politicians and the public that, that there is things they should be concerned about. We are not certain in our own mind that this war global warming is going to happen, but the, the consequences of it happening if it does, it could be dire. Could be very devastating to many parts of the world. And it seems to us that the rational approach of this is to start taking action now, particularly on many things, because there are many of the things we could do make good sense for many reasons, only one of which is global warming. And what sort of action? Would this be with the people or with the politicians or with everybody? And you're fighting these strong uh, groups that have ec economic vested interest to uh, not slow down or any of these um, contributors to global warming? Yeah, well, I guess my feeling is that the biggest contributor to global warming is burning fossil fuel, and the biggest contributor to the urban air pollution problems we have in a city like Vancouver is also burning fossil fuel. The biggest problem of causing acid rain is burning fossil fuel. We have a whole variety of environmental uh, problems which relate back to the fact that Canadians are among the world's most uh, uh, overusers. We use more energy per person than any other country in the world, and I don't think it's justified. We, we tend to live in a very energy-intensive society, uh, and we could not only uh, benefit our environment, but we could probably benefit some of our economy because the use of all that energy is extensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. We're importing a lot of energy. We are causing, uh, we are spending vast amounts of money, or we were on Hibernian things, to create energy, or at least a source of energy, which we're then going to burn. Mm -hmm. To me, it doesn't make any sense. 
you were telling me that um, one of your worries is that there's not enough people uh, that are entering uh, the environmental uh, faculties that are, that are taking some of the, what we call the harder sciences, like math and physics and chemistry. Can you tell us why and why you'd like to see more of the, more of the students taking these courses? Well, of course, I'm somewhat biased because I'm a math and physics uh, major from university days. Uh, I think there are many of these environmental issues that need to be addressed through what we would call the math and physical sciences. Um, and at the present time, one of our biggest problems in making progress in this area is actually just the, the numbers of, of top-rate people we have in the field. We need to attract in essentially more brain power. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to, to get uh, young females and young males in both our country and around the world thinking that these are exciting, important areas. I think there's a... a how, how can that be done? Um, you're competing with uh, entertainers, athletes, uh, the salaries they're making, um, a lot of choices. Yes, well, I guess it's unrealistic for me to think that we're going to compete on a salary basis. Um, I guess we have to compete on, first of all, the recognition that this is an important area and people have a certain uh, sort of want to make their contribution. I mean, a lot of people do things not for a dollar. Mm -hmm. I hope I do, and I think a lot of other people do too. Um, I think we want to get well, people... Well, we're doing a show. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't got my bill yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, no, but I think, you know, we, we have... To, there is a motivation, and I think a lot of people are motivated on environmental issues, but they tend not to realize the connection between the math and physical sciences and environmental issues. And I think that's a connection we need to make earlier on. Well, I hope we do. Dr. McBean, our time is up. Thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. For Contact and Anderson's Restaurant, I'm Craig Delahunt. Please join us again next time. <laughs>